Martin. Welcome back. My name is Stefanie schulte strathaus and um, Mark and Alexandra asked me to moderate this second panel, which I'm very happy, of course, to do, not least because as uh, the director of Arsenal, which has been um, responsible for the Berlinale Forum since 1971, I feel very connected to this topic. Emerging from a crisis at the Berlinale, the forum presented itself as an independent section for political and experimental films, for the innovative and visionary, for cinema that is critical, challenging and provocative, both in terms of content and aesthetics. The Arsenal Institute for Film and Video Art, at, uh, at that time known as Freunde der Deutschen Kinematik, was founded in 1963, the same year as the Kleines Fernsehspiel, and had very similar ideas and visions. This resulted in a connection between television and cinema, the home and the movie, that was characterized by shared solidarity for decades. Kleines Fernsehspiel discovered filmmakers at the forum who it later supported, and vice versa. Productions of Kleines Fernsehspiel celebrated their festival premieres at the forum. Since Arsenal subtitled many of the forum films in German, then used these prints for distribution in German-speaking countries, a comprehensive archive has been created over the years, which is physically located over there, in silent green. Um, and um, quite a few of the films lying there are productions of Kleines Fernsehspiel. And I just, because it's always lying on my desk, this is the address book of my predecessor, Alf Boyd. And of course, the last page is full of ZDF. Um, like all our address books, because it was not only the forum, it was also the, for the Asnard programming, we um, used um, the Z ZDF um, Kleines Fernsehspiel archive a lot in the 90s mainly and 2000s. A cinema um, or television that wants to make a difference needs one thing above all, freedom for a variety of perspectives that can enter into a dialogue with each other. It is self-critical and open to the world. It is transnational in order to overcome social cultural boundaries in thought and cultural practice. From the perspective of an archive, however, it becomes clear today what a radical cultural political exception this decade long practice, the insistence on the idea of was anderes machen, doing something different, represented. Cultural preservation is generally seen as the responsibility of the nation state. This means that an international archive like ours is not considered part of the national cultural heritage, even though the films are in our possession because they have influenced generations of audiences in Germany. The situation is somewhat different from the ZDF archive because the productions of German television, um, though, um, because as productions of German television, those films meet the criteria, although I'm not so sure anymore after the Fabian's presentation um, and when I found out that they are listed as um, um, the, the um, country of origin is listed, listed um, elsewhere, it would be interesting to find out whether we get German funding for restoration of those films. Um, this makes it all the more important that we now work together on this legacy and explore the question of what transnational actually means. It is undisputed that the films that were shown at the Forum, Arsenal or ZDF had a strong influence on our understanding of cinema and opened our eyes to the world long before globalization. But what did this mean for the countries from which these films came? How did and do filmmakers in Eastern Europe or the so-called Global South see these in initiatives? Um, we got some impressions already in this morning. Were the protagonists following Western projections that primarily served their own interests, and I include also um, our own institution, or were they genuine pioneers who had a different vision of the world and wanted to build free cultural spaces beyond the nation state? Was there really an equal dialogue? If there can be such a thing, and if so, what impact did it have? And last but not least, although I suspect that there will hardly be enough time for this today, when we look back on our shared history, what responsibility does this entail in a present in which these spaces are closing again in front of our eyes against the backdrop of wars and social division? Um, our first speaker is Barbara Wurm. She studied comparative literature and Slavic studies in Vienna, Moscow, Innsbruck, Munich and Leipzig. From 2020 to 23, she was a member of the selection committee of the Berlin um, com uh, of, the, of the Berlinale competition, and since August this year, she's the director of the forum. So she became an Arsenal um, member, like everyone is a member who 
comes to the Arsenal. But she works for it. <laughs> and she also worked as a programmer for other festivals like Go East, um, Festival of Central and Eastern European Film, Doc Leipzig, and the International Short Film Festival Oberhausen for one year. Furthermore, she has developed film programs for international festivals and cinematics. As a slavist, she has conducted research on the Eastern European avant-garde and post-Soviet post -Soviet cinema at the universities of Vienna, um, Basel, and Berlin, and others. She has also published books on Ziga Vertov and about the history of Russian and Soviet cinema. Her doctoral dissertation was on Soviet Kultur film of the 1920s. Her work as a research assistant at the Humboldt University in Berlin, which will now be put on hold for the duration of her directorship of the forum, focuses on Eastern European cultural studies and the theory and history of film. Please welcome Barbara Wurm. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm a paid for member of the Arsenal. And how much my academic life is put on hold, you will now be witnessing. <laughs> because if I can give you one advice, if you ever become the head of forum, <laughs> do not agree to participate <laughs> in an academic conference, especially after a panel, an opening panel, that is just so uh, great, <laughs> inspiring. And uh, I, get, I became very envious also when I heard you speak after the panel about uh, book, book publications, etc. The depth of your research is not comparable to what I did. So <laughs> I um, apologize for that. Um, but I use my, all my uh, instinct and also my actual work uh, for the forum, uh, which is much connected. For example, yesterday we discussed uh, which films we could select for subtitling, for putting German subtitles. So it, re it refers very much to what uh, Stephanie said. Um, I have a very enigmatic and abbreviated title. I chose it, kind of playful, but uh, it will end in, I think, a bit, not tragic, but uh, thoughtful way. Uh, it's a combination of the topic that I was assigned <laughs> to Eastern European cinema in the selection of uh, ZDF Kleines Fernsehspiel productions and broadcast uh, films. And uh, one of them is, is it Eastern European? We don't know. It is Eastern German. <laughs> it is a classic. It's Winter AD by Helke Misselwitz. Uh, my colleague Birgit Kohler made a long extensive interview with Helke and uh, recorded a podcast which you can hear or could already hear. And the Ade in uh, this title, and I'm going to shortly talk about the symbolic uh, aspect of titles, uh, is of course something that uh, remains in doubt. And the bigger picture that I asked myself was, why was I assigned, I mean, I understood why <laughs> I was assigned to do the Eastern European, but what, what is the status of Eastern European cinema in this selection? And uh, thankfully, Nikolaus already <laughs> pointed out the peaks uh, because he went back to the history books. Uh, another angle would have been the one with uh, starting with the Padrone and uh, his death. Uh, I translated, or people translated, Willy Winkler's um, Nachruf der Patrone is tot. Of course, attempts were made to relegate Eckhard Stein to Arte, but the quota was only invented towards the end of his tenure. This allowed him to work for a long time on his provocative inno innovation institution for all and to contribute to the world renown that German film actually enjoyed for a short time. Stein was awarded the usual prizes, including the French Legion of Honor, but what pleased him most, as he asserted, was that 40 of his small and large television plays were shown in the Moscow Film Museum. This is, of course, as you probably know, uh, Naum Kleiman's uh, Musée Kino, uh, um, and it has a big uh, relation and history and present time to the Gregors as the founders of the Arsenal. And, uh, uh, it's one aspect of transnational, uh, not just archive, but uh, continuous history and, and feedback, basically. Feedbacking of a broadcasting history in, uh, in cinema institutions. Um, so, as I do not manage uh, to sum up some research, because I haven't done it, <laughs> I will uh, focus shortly on methodological questions and suggestions which I should uh, which I think are, are relevant questions and could be a relevant questions for the scholars that you work with. 
and I'm very happy to mediate in every possible <laughs> way, uh, but I just could not uh, do all this. Um, uh, but I think it would be uh, worthwhile to focus on the question, what happens if we focus on a certain region? Is it a region? What is it? What is Eastern Europe? What is Central Eastern Europe? Uh, in connection to the question, how did um, how what, what uh, ZDF did was uh, transnational from the very beginnings. And the short examples that I'm going to give are also a reflection of geopolitics and the history of geopolitics and the circles of history. And it relates again back to what Stephanie said in the beginning that we are talking about all this and about our research and about these films uh, in uh, heavy, not cold, but hot war times. Um, and these films are all reflections of this topic. Um, another uh, more specific interest or topics would be uh, to ask not just about the German cultural policy that, or diplomacy that is behind uh, the certain, a certain selection of what ZDF Kleines Fernsehspiel did, but also looking at this specific part of Cold War uh, of German cultural diplomacy as a strategy as a media strategy in Cold War in general and in an attempt to overcome Cold War uh, situation. If I browse through the uh, Sendelisten, um, I realize that uh, it is a super means of understanding alternative film histories, <laughs> much better than rereading all the prominent canonical uh, um, film histories, because it's just amazing at what point uh, names, uh, gender twists, uh, documentary um, um, highlight, etc., come into play. Uh, it is a, a hidden treasure, I would say, of uh, discoveries, and it would very much worth, be worthwhile doing one forum edition just with TV films or broadcasted films uh, in ZDF Kleines Fernsehspiel. Um, what I also think is that and, um, Helke Misselwitz project and uh, Winter AD is part of that, that the reunification project in, in Europe uh, in Germany, in Europe, uh, happened in media to a large part, and uh, the history of these films are part of this uh, transfer or uh, active political um, reunification movement. And uh, the last point um, that I make here, cinema versus, f or uh, the cinema versus the television uh, channels, I think it's, uh, an in, it would be an interesting uh, question to ask ourselves, what does it mean to go public at a certain time? So at what time do our film festivals, maybe even the broader or the more outreaching international platform than a local uh, TV station, and at what time could that change? Um, for this, from a Central European perspective, uh, one uh, interesting question that can pop up if you browse through these um, uh, broadcasting lists uh, is the question whether there exists some kind of inner geopolitical map within the Central Eastern European um, uh, uh, countries. Uh, for example, Eckhard Stein projects are much uh, working with uh, Hungarian filmmakers. Uh, at some point, uh, Yugoslavia, as already, was already mentioned, is popping up, but not the uh, usual suspe suspects. Like Zilnik is, for example, not part of this list, uh, but we know that he made his only recently re rediscovered and shown, I think also in cinema uh, Transtopia, uh, German uh, broadcast films with ARD, if I'm correct. <laughs> Um, and he has hilarious stories about how he was actually, after just finishing uh, making this film, forced out of the country to leave th through the back door. So we have to go back to the filmmakers, of course, to, <laughs> uh, to compl complete the picture. And uh, I grew up in Austria. I have a, a personal <laughs> Eastern European film history, if you want, on TV. It would make sense to go through the broadcasting list of ORF, not just for, through BBC or RAI, Italian television, which did so much, uh, especially uh, in relation to Soviet cinema. Uh, until now, actually. And yeah, the last question I'm going to jump, because a film festival and cinema distribution question is 
too big to be elaborated here. So the six uh, films that are chosen for this exhibit, uh, four of them I uh, put on this uh, slide, Organitäten, Transplantations by Andrzej Weider, a very peculiar science fiction film from 68, which I don't know, it's actually playing parallel to our first, <laughs> was playing parallel to our first panel, but I wanted to hear you. <laughs> The second is Is It Easy to Be Young, a classic by Yuri Spodniks uh, from 87, a classic in terms of perestroika cinema. And uh, Potnik's becoming a cult figure of uh, Soviet uh, film or late Soviet film. And uh, if everything goes right, then there will be a chance, you will have a chance to, maybe in Arsenal only, but maybe in Forum, maybe in Berlinale. Uh, there is a, a current documentary, it's called Podniks on Podniks. It actually goes back to Podniks archives to comment his own biography, filmography. So please watch out for Podniks on Podniks. Helke Mislevitz, Winter AD, and Alexander Rodnianski's film Farewell USSR. I'm going to jump across the symbolic uh, surplus of film titles question, but it becomes clear that I think even the, t the titles already, but especially the films, always carry a symbolic and a content note of what these films refer to. And if Helke Mislevitz says that Winter Ade divorce hurts, Winter Ade Scheiden tut weh, the title wasn't meant to suggest that it was about divorced women. It was actually intended to be much bigger than that. I think a lot of these much bigger <laughs> is referred to in the titles. And that's a very tricky question because uh, these titles can sometimes not be found, not just because of uh, whatever is incomplete in, uh, in uh, IMDB, but especially for translation reasons. So for example, I got mixed up totally uh, for my uh, main topic, <laughs> which is the film Goodbye USSR, or Goodbye UDSSR, Goodbye UDSSR is actually the German title of the film by Alexander Rodnianski. There were two of them, one in 91, uh, shown, broadcasted in uh, September 92, Goodbye UDSSR, and uh, another one in 94, Letzter Abschied UDSSR. And uh, that second film is to, can be found on YouTube <laughs> in a Russian version. Not subtitled, but some intertitles are German, <laughs> which may be the case because they are uh, taken from some German uh, archive footage. But uh, so there is also work to be done in this uh, interlingual uh, sense. And uh, the th uh, three other uh, films, I'm not going to uh, go into more details, uh, are already screening. Jasmila Zbanic's film, Grbavica, which is Esmas Geheimnitz in German, Christian Munju's uh, Four Months, and uh, Nana and uh, Simon's film, In Bloom. Um, so from a genre, sci-fi, uh, uh, auteur, uh, by the Zanussi, all these uh, big names of Polish cinema, for example, lesser known from Czechoslovakian cinema. From Polish, there's also another uh, thing in, happening in '69. Uh, ZDF Kleines Fernsehspiel is showing a series, Kleine Geschichte der Weltliteratur. So there is also an, an inner European, Eastern European kind of uh, connection to certain other forms of media and art. I find that very interesting. Um, uh, so it was not so easy to understand that the film that I saw and I kept in my archive with the title Goodbye USSR or Farewell USSR is not the film <laughs> showing in this uh, exhibit. Um, and it makes sense, another uh, couple of suggestions for research to not just uh, evaluate the selection uh, made by ZDF Kleines Fernsehspiel of the projects, the ones co-produced and the ones broadcasted, but also about the selection of the uh, um, uh, curators uh, of the exhibition. And in the last step, maybe the selection by the audience, <laughs> which films they choose to watch. I think uh, audio, it's really basically the archive becomes a place for audio, for production and audience um, uh, experience. I'm gonna jump across Winter Adi. I'm very sorry. There is a wonderful um, uh, review by Annette Eckert on this film, uh, pointing out that in itself it is a 
exposure of German-German differences across walls and national borders. And it's a picture that is a border crossing without a passport. I find that a very beautiful uh, image of what is happening transnationally within one film, just by the very fact that uh, people are filmed and the film is screened <laughs> across that uh, existing, non-existing border. And Helke Mislevitz answers on the question how she found the courage to make this film. Courage is everywhere, you just have to show it. It just has to be shown in our media, pointing out the necessity of uh, getting access to an audience. Um, shortly, the signif most significant um, passage of her Forum Gespräch with uh, Ulrich Gregor. From the sound, some of you might be able to judge whether this was in the Arsenal screening or in Academy screening. <laughs> I couldn't. <laughs> so let's hope that there is something to be heard. No, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to do all the, the you want to listen to it, I know. Okay. <laughs> because I did a transliteration of it, but. Uh, Why is it not happening? Compute? No, no, it's just not playing. That's the problem. Anyway, so maybe I'll find it afterwards, but this is what they say. Ulrich Gregor says, this film was shown in cinema in the GDR, and it's interesting that films like this are shown in cinemas and are seen and they last a certain amount of time and fulfill their function there, but not on television in the GDR. And then later on television as well, Question, Helke Mislevit, Heike Mislevit, Helke Mislevit. Well, all I know is that ZDF has bought this film, Das kleine Fernsehspiel, and will broadcast it. Yes, that's typical for our areas. <laughs> yes, I'm very sorry about this, because certain areas in the GDR can't receive West German television. And so, of course, viewers are lost, and I'm very sorry about that. In short, our television, GDR television, is not interested in this movie. Hmm. Why not, says a person from the audience. You'll have to ask our television that, says Helke Mislevitz, person from the audience. So it's for political reasons. Well, what non-political reasons are there? <laughs> so all films in selection have a political reasoning <laughs> behind them. In the case of Anche Vaida's transplantation, it is an, a, a, it's a political allegory. The film is not, as is stated in the material approval, uh, less interested in dealing with or showing any surgical problems. He is more interested in portraying in the genre of the social critical utopia the consequences that organ transplantation can lead to. So all the films, in, some, in, in all the films you can find some uh, political um, aspect. Podniks, um, Is It Easy to Be Young, uh, the sculpt film. Ooh. Uh, is really, really something. Um, it is basically a documentary of the end of the Soviet Union by observing uh, police force against youth who incidentally, uh, uh, during a rock concert, um, are demolition, uh, participating in demolition of some items. And... Um, and a huge demonstration movement starts and the first confrontation with uh, military uh, on the street. Uh, and this reflects very much to the film by Alexander Rodnyansky, where he says that uh, in 1991, uh, the situation he was filming in Russia, in Moscow at that time, uh, the army wearing weapons on the street against the people is the first time after the end of Second World War, that weapons were worn outside a demonstra demonstra for demonstration means, so parades or um, um, and um, yeah, of course this is becoming more and more important. I don't know why I can. Ah, yeah, okay. So this is Podnik's, and uh, interestingly enough, in the archive on Podnik's film, there is a nice uh, letter from a, from a viewer. She's a Slavic scholar like myself, and she's super happy about the fact that this film is screened. Uh, such films are so, uh, so rarely seen on German TV. Can you please tell me all about it? Can you send me the producer's contact, etc.? And Ursula Stein, um, in her wonderful... Oops! 
friendly way, reminding so much of also the friendliness of forum, uh, giving out all the material <laughs> the archive history says, an bei die Broschüre Ventilator eine Reihe im ZDF, die wir eingerichtet haben, um uns sehr wichtige auch für den Zuschauerfernsehspiele zu wiederholen. Am 30.09. wird in dieser Reihe auch Ist es leicht jung zu sein wiederholt. Ich schlage vor, Sie zeichnen den Film auf Video auf, dann haben Sie auch den Text. So it's like the editor, or at least some relative of the editor, <laughs> not relative, sorry, uh, so a colleague, <laughs> uh, recommending to, um, to do pr some private archiving. Time. Okay, time is up. And I have finally reached the film that I wanted to talk about. Uh, it is Goodbye USSR, Farewell USSR by Alexander Rodnyansky. So, uh, the, it is from 1991, the film that is in the exhibition. The more popular one is actually the one from 1994, part two. And this morning I made, an, I'm gonna maybe not show you the trailer, but show you a little bit of the interview with uh, Alexander Rodnyansky, because this morning uh, I managed to interview him on uh, these two films. I asked him if he recalled the context uh, of the emergence of this project. He very much recalls it. He just recently uh, restored um, the um, both uh, remastered uh, both films from 1991 and 1994. So they are now accessible in very good shape. He said they're probably in better shape than they were ever before. And uh, so par part one is focusing on Jewish uh, Soviet film history. Где похоронены мой отец, два деда, бабушка и двоюродная сестра. В это вы. Um, he's Jewish, Ukrainian, uh, personality, very famous, most famous producer uh, of Russia in the last 20 years, festival director. Uh, who one day before the invasion or one day after that I don't know, uh, fled Russia. His son is the most influential economical advisor of uh, President of Ukraine, Zelensky. Uh, he has a triple identity, <laughs> Jewish, Russian, Ukrainian. He made a film in the 90s about uh, his Jewish identity, his Jewish Ukrainian identity in Moscow. And in my interview today, and I will just pass it on to the archive, I will not show it now. Um, it's 18 minutes if we have a break and you want to watch it, we can watch it together. He says that he's now working on part three um, because, uh, of course, uh, the films have become the most important part of his personal archive. And uh, this project back then gave him the possibility to um, yeah, re-access his own biography, which is a fundamental representational biography in the history of the Soviet Union, the apparent end of the Soviet Union and the unlucky uh, resurrections of this empire. Unlucky and forceful and uh, devastating and damaging re and resurrections of this empire. And uh, yeah, so Rodnyansky uh, remembered very well Eckhard Stein, but much more Claudia Troni, <laughs> who was uh, the initiator of this project. He said he was very young back then, but a little bit known in the documentary field. So he was discovered in the festival, encouraged to do these films. And for him, it was not just the starting point of a, a broader career, but also as a media I would say typhoon, <laughs> tycoon, <laughs> how do you say? Uh, he uh, got very much um, inspired by uh, the importance of TV channels and he is the founder of One Plus One, which is the most important Ukraine independent uh, TV channel until today. And uh, it's just the history of Cold War um, bias, I would say, that the private a TV channel that he founded and uh, was running for a long time before he went to Russia to work there also on television, um, has become the place of what ZDF, Kleines Fernsehspiel, has taught him 
uh, of being uh, in terms of a variety, diversion, and political um, ambience of uh, filmmaking. So in the Eastern <laughs> European context, it was not the state and not the public broadcasting TVs that could embrace that aspect, but the private ones. And so in this way, all these circles are closing in a very open, I would say, um, note. And so does my speech. Thank you very much, Barbara. We will um, discuss this later. And we are also very much looking forward to seeing the um, interview that you did this morning um, another time. Um, I would now like to introduce our next speaker. Um, Bukhari Sawadogo is professor of cinema studies in the, uh, at the University, City University of New York. He, his research centers in African cinema and African American cinema. He is the author of four books on African cinema, including African Studies, an Introduction, um, West African Screen Media, Comedy, TV, Series, and Transnationalization, um, African Film Studies, an Introduction, and uh, Les Cinema Francophone um, West African. Um, he is the founding director of the Harlem African Animation Festival, which was established in 2021. Um, this festival is the first of its kind in the United States, ex exclusively dedicated to African animated films and series. Please welcome Bukhari Sabodogo. Good morning or good evening. <laughs> okay, let me start by uh, say thank you to Alexandra here, to Mark for inviting me for this uh, presentation and my contribution. And also I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Professor Ori Justin, who is the ambassador of uh, my home country, Burkina Faso, to uh, Germany here. He's with us in the audience here, thank you. And uh, also thanks to uh, the very tough act to follow from Barbara, uh, who I will have a pleasure to discussing with, and thank you for Stephanie. So my presentation, uh, okay, it's already up. So it's on, uh, I have to focus here, okay. So uh, my presentation is on uh, the, D the role of ZDF in African cinema, and uh, for this, I would like to bring into the conversation uh, transnational and transmedia, which means uh, the intersection of cinema and uh, television when it comes to African cinema. By really, my talk here will be around three points. The three points are, first, the context, because the context of the intervention of the influence or let's say the broadcasting and production agreements of ZDF in African cinema, I think the context will really help us have a view of what was the role of the ZDF, even if I'm not dire you know, directly engaging it. And the second is, since uh, this uh, symposium, the title is uh, situation, Situated History, there is no better example than taking the case of uh, the school, the post-80s school of Burkina Faso to talk about uh, the topic. And then I would like to move beyond uh, Burkina Faso to talk about the documentary practice and also the gender consideration when it comes to African cinema. I know this uh, symposium is about history. But history is also the presence, and I think uh, Barbara was mentioning it about the, what is going on. But history is, is, is also about the present, and for the presence, uh, as African screen media production is concerned, is looking at what is now shaping the landscape of media and film production in Africa. Short, let's go to it. We'll start with... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the context. Okay. Should I say that most of the significant intervention 
of uh, ZDF in African media production, film and media production, happened in the 80s and 90s. The 80s and 90s, what was happening in terms of uh, economic downturn? You have the crisis of the debt, and that led the IMF and the World Bank to impose the SAPS, Structural Adjustment Program. And that effect is the, I would say, the slashing, the cuts of budgets to culture, education, and health. Which means, in terms of film production, the usual model of a seed funding of African cinema started to face headwinds and challenges. So co-productions or productions provided by ZDF was welcomed. So you have uh, that economic component. And then you have uh, one other thing in terms of economic downturn happened in the 90s, which is uh, January 1st, 1994 you have the devaluation of the CFR francs, which is a currency shared by 14 West and Central African countries. So imagine that you wake up the next day and 50% of your currency is gone. And that also translates into financial hardship for productions <clears throat> for, productions for African countries. So obviously, any help or any uh, co-production agreement from the outside is welcome. So that's on the context of uh, film production. And I would like to move to the second, which is uh, film distribution. Forms of, forms, of transmedia, uh, forms of transmedia. Here I'm bringing into conversation I would say the African film television distribution, where you have an encounter between African cinema and uh, television. So trying to get you on the track here. So production-wise, very challenging. What about theatrical and television, television distribution of African cinema at the time? That also was uh, challenging because theater starting closing theater starting closing simply because of economic context. And if you take the case of Burkina Faso, you have uh, the national film distribution company known as Sunasib. And that company has not to be closed, but has to be private, uh, privatized. And it was privatized in 2004. And uh, you have Idrissa Widraogo, who, uh, whom, uh, who I will be talking about, who was one of those who stepped in to try to give it a new life. And in terms of television uh, distribution, at that time in the 90s, you only have uh, the, the public national broadcaster, TNB, that was offering the only distribution outlet. At that, at that time in Burkina Faso, you have one s small uh, private TV station called TVZ, but it was not in a position to, dis to distribute or uh, dis uh, broadcast, I would say, African cinema. And that is almost uh, the case of Burkina Faso is not a loner. That is kind of reflective of what is what's going on in terms of landscape of distribution, which is theatrical-wise, you have a theater's closing. In terms of uh, television, you have you know, only national broadcasters. And then we move to uh, whatever beyond the continent. What was the distribution of African cinema beyond the continent? In the 80s and 90s, you have uh, the festi uh, festival routes, the festival, the festival routes, which is going to the A, you know, a class theater, uh, festival. You have Cannes, you have Berlin, you have Venice. Uh, to the point that in terms of there is a criticism that was level, leveled of African filmmakers at the time saying that you are just doing caliber cinema, which is basically you finish your film, you just put it under your arm, you just go to festival, to the point that African films made about Africa for African audiences, they have few opportunities to see it. 
So which means that if the, those films come here in the global north, and I think some of the panelists was uh, you know, alluding to that question with, uh, in terms of curating, who decides what films comes here? So when they come here, if they're not seen in festival, how do they reach the households? And that's where ZDF you know, and other television has been playing a critical role at the time. Because you have in the case of ZDF in Germany here, you have, you have a French-German uh, RT, and then you have Channel, uh, channel 4, uh, the British uh, public uh, channel. So those, are, I'm giving you this context to give uh, the 90s and 80s where African cinema, in terms of produ a production, distribution, whether on the continent or outside of the continent, was really facing uh, headwinds. So which means that you, if you have a transnational actor like ZDF, it's gonna help kinda loosen a little bit the challenges. And now I'm moving to a uh, kind of case study, the post-80s uh, in a School. So, what is it, the post-80s uh, book in a school? Can I move with the mic? I'm a little bit taller and I have to always lean in. Sorry, okay. So what is uh, the post-80s uh, book in a school? The post-80s book in a school is uh, simply, it's coined by the scholar named uh, Brahim Deniz. And in her book, uh, African uh, Cinema d'Afrique uh, Noir Francophone et Maghreb, so African, uh, Francophone African and Maghreb Cinema, came out in 1997. And for her, she, she coined uh, this, I would say, term to refer to a corpus of Burkina Faso cinema featuring, I would say, thematic treatment around African village, I would say the timeless African village, childhood and social exclusion. It doesn't mean that for every film to uh, be qualified under this uh, concept, all the three has to be, uh, the three uh, feature has to be met. Sometimes you only have one or two. And also, if we expand the scope of the analysis, sometimes it goes beyond uh, Burkina Faso. What have we selected uh, movies the, for the Burkina uh, Faso post 80 school? You have uh, Yaba, you have Karim El Salah by uh, Idrissa Widraugo. Yaba, which is uh, well known as uh, this, uh, I would say, tale of universality of friendship between an old woman excuse, uh, accused of witchcraft and a very young boy that is kind of linking him between uh, her position as a social outcast and the village. And Karim and Salah is uh, continuing on that theme of uh, the village and also social outcasts. So you have a very young boy who, whose mother has been uh, given to her, his uncle under the tradition of leverage and uh, she has to go through some challenges. And then you have uh, Lafi, which is a ZDF uh, distributed movie by Pierre Yamergo. And here is a kind of, um, I'll say, um, more a story of um, upcoming. Upcoming here, why? Because uh, you have a Joe who is here who is a high school graduate, and his ambition is to be, a, uh, to be a doctor, to go to France to medical school. But he will he'll face the challenge that there's no scholarship to go to, uh, to study medicine, but instead is offered the, uh, the options of go for law or sec a secretary school. So he has to try to jump through 
all the bureaucracy and get the permission from a minister. So in many ways, you can compare this film to, um, I would say, Money Order by Samben Usman, where I talk about how you have to jump through uh, bureaucracy. And I'm going to go fast here. You have, uh, so these are the selected movie. Well, in terms of aesthetics, what do we have? In terms of aesthetics, you have, if you take on the, uh, you take on one point, cinematography. So you have a very economical use of uh, film techniques here, which uh, when I want to say economical use, in terms of takes, most are long shots. And we know in terms of long shots, what does it render in terms of, uh, pace in terms of a rhythm of a movie is very slow. And that slowness kind of reflects uh, life in the village. And also slowness in terms of we, the, uh, the audience engaging with movies means that it forces us to engage with what is on the screen. Why, and also that's um, uh, also it's a part of efforts to render realism. And we know realism, the intersection between realism and political engagement. And uh, in terms of also of uh, the special uh, construction of marginality, you have a dual, uh, I would say, opposition between the village and uh, uh, the, the, uh, the city because we'll see it with the films of Jamarite, no? You have what's the definition of what is modernity. Modernity always being associated with uh, the city. And also as part of the aesthetic construction here is how African storytellers are reappropriating space to construct their own stories you know, away from uh, colonial era uh, you know, representation of a space. And then I conclude with uh, the Burkina Bay uh, 1980s uh, school of uh, cinema, which is simply the 1980s to the end of the 1990s is considered the golden decades of Burkina Faso cinema. And then beyond. I wanted to add a little bit more of documentary practice with uh, Jean-Marie Teno. Start with uh, Trando, which is not a documentary, it's a, you know, it's a drama film where, with uh, Anatole, the main character, who has uh, trouble simply facing unemployment and political persecution in uh, Cameroon. So he comes to Germany here, uh, Cologne as an illegal immigrant, and then goes back to his country you know, to try to force political change. And you have a trip to my country, uh, which is uh, Jean-Marie uh, Jean Teno's documentary here, all centered around the question of modernity. So what do we define, what is modern? Modern in these documentaries uh, is always the Western related or the Western centric, which is a, a very discussion to have when you talk about modernity. Uh, I'm putting the two together. One is a fiction, one is a documentary, but also, but we see how in uh, in what is fiction, the very documentary. F uh, you know, I would say fact-finding aesthetics that is there and also the politically assumed messaging that is there. And then beyond uh, documentary, beyond uh, Burkina Faso 1980s, you have uh, gender, the question of gender, particularly with uh, with Sek Uma Shisoko. And here it's, you have Nayuma, uh, who is a, a woman in a village in Mali. And uh, her husband died, and she's forced to marry uh, the younger brother of her husband. In this case, it's uh, called the Leveret. And I was saying you have the Leveret in this movie, but also in Karim Esala. 
And in terms of aesthetics here, you have using the humor, and that humor is uh, drawing on the Koteba theater, which is a theater tradition in West Africa. How do you use that to tell uh, African you know, stories? Which is, you know, speak to a larger question of uh, storytelling, but, you know, drawing from all your cultural resources. And more here about animation. So we've been talking about the ZD of the 80s, the 90s, fiction, uh, documentary. But now what's going on, you have uh, what at least uh, this film was screened at my festival less than two weeks ago. And uh, she's by a... A Nigerian woman director, I think she's based in Germany here, and uh, it's, uh, I think ZDF has, is one of the uh, distributors for this movie, uh, yeah, this movie, and the story is simply, um, it's a folktale based on, on, I would say, a, pr a prince who faces uh, challenges from her stepmother who doesn't simply want him to be, you know, to become the king, to put it very short. Earlier I was saying that, yeah, this conference, this symposium about history, but history is also present. So what are the changes that we see happening across the, uh, the continent when it comes to media and film production? I think thinking about the larger space, those three are the ones that are really shaping this, uh, the, uh, the landscape in African uh, landscape now. So you have animation, you have gaming, and you have, two, you have television serials. To the point that at last Fespaco, I was at different panels where filmmakers openly talk about how many of them, you know, will step away, do a lot of uh, television content serials to have enough resources, you know, and get back to film productions. So we have to keep in mind that those are the, uh, those are the areas of growth, of popularity, and uh, more and more, uh, yes, festival routes is important in terms of pro uh, distribution route, television, yes, but also more content are online. And that has uh, different implications when it comes to aesthetics, also implication when it comes to curatorial choices. How am I doing time-wise? Good, okay. So on that end, uh, I will simply uh, say uh, thank you. Uh, if I speak German, I will say vielen Dank. Yeah. No, I will let you choose. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Just put my bag. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, and uh, Lucaria, just have one question to clarify. Among the films that you mentioned, uh, I know that um, uh, Klando was, uh, I think, ZDF Kleines Fernsehspiel, and um, A Trip to the Country was ZDF. I'm not so sure if it was Kleines Fernsehspiel. It was, by the way, also in the forum. We have a print here in the archive. With the other films, I'm not so sure. You, you said you are, um, they were selected, but for what? Like to be screened on ZDF, or were there also co-productions? Uh, for Yaba, Yaba is a co-production. La Fille uh, was broadcast by the ZDF. And uh, for Jean-Marie Stenosa productions. OK. Yeah. Um, I, uh, in, in one of your books, you um, mention not the term transnationalism, but transnationalization, um, which I think is very interesting also in terms of history in both of your presentations and how things changed and the, and the meaning of 
transnational corporations um, um, changed over time. Um, uh, and in our conversation before um, we met, you were um, also talking about not co-productions, but about um, traveling images, which I found a very important um, uh, focus on the idea of transnationalism. So it's not only about co-productions, it's also about what we perceive, and of course very clearly in your presentation um, in, the, in the situation of the Cold War, uh, where um, images could travel, um, uh, but often only images, um, and sometimes not even them. Um, so maybe both of you could elaborate a little bit on, on this idea of traveling images. Barbara, do you want to take the hot potato? Okay. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure when, when in the history of uh, film theory uh, did the transnational cinema uh, pop up? Help me. Some years ago only? 20. 20. Still some. Um, because we are relating back to films at a time when there was not that notion. And I think it's interesting to to not just talk about the um, traveling images and um, what happens to them or can happen potentially to them if they end up in a in an archive that is being reopened, um, because that is actually the aspect that I forgot to mention. And is for Eastern European cinema the most interesting is that. Um, because censorship uh, was so <laughs> uh, prominent and present in the film production, um, right now, going through some alternative uh, film archives, I realized, together with my colleagues, especially from Russia, uh, but also maybe other countries, that um, back in the already 70s and 80s, uh, a lot more critical, subversive films could be made, uh, produced by television, also Hungary, for example. And uh, that has to do with the production system and the censorship system. Um, so I was wondering whether, you know, this kind of, because it's, I mean, tr tr traveling image is only in the case if archives get reopened, because if they're now getting closed again, which is the case at least in Moscow, and it affects so much. <laughs> the whole research uh, union, I would say. Um, then the traveling stops, <laughs> and then the borders are being reestablished. Um, and then it happens, in, as in the case with Rodnansky, that it becomes some kind of private enterprise. That is, um, of course, in this case, perfectly linking back to the idea of um, private footage, even. Um, reconstructing your own biography as a re representation of the country's uh, history. But um, the, the traveling in, in that aspect would be for me more interestingly between public sphere and, and the private archives or the, the archives that you can access uh, like easily, more easily, at least mentally. And then physically the, the material archives help you to, to get back to the Yes, and cr also chronologies that you maybe have forgotten already. For example, when I started working on my own private biography with Eastern Europe, in the, when the second invasion of Russia against Ukraine started, I found out that there were so many aspects back then in the 90s that I completely forgot about. And for example, in the Radnyansky case, I completely forgot about that it was already tackling the Jewish identity question, which was then so revolutionary because it was such a hidden and silent topic and it's silenced again, of course, because it's getting more and more complicated now with Ukrainian identities, etc. Okay, to your question of uh, circulation of images where we should talk about, or at least, you know, I'm speaking, uh, I'm addressing it in my, some of my work as transnationalization, because I think we are, when I say we, I'm saying simply we are witnessing less of a monopoly of uh, established uh, institutional circulation of images. When I say institutional, I'm talking about uh, I would say theaters as we know it. Now we don't even, you know, in terms of theaters less because we have streaming. And also festival, you know, because we still have more festivals, but less and less. 
what we have now is kind of um, opening up of circulation of uh, images from from the uh, from the point uh, to the uh, from the point where every one of us with our handheld devices create images and circulate and I will apply that concept to movies we go online or at least on, uh, on the continent we see how young people with some of the very basic editing software in our phones we purpose movies and circulates among us on WhatsApp groups or posted on YouTube which means that we were not going through any curatorial, I don't want to say institution, but just do it. And also you have um, what is also a little bit akin to the star system in the U.S. because uh, on the continent it has been, um, on it, it is all diversity has been that when you talk about African cinema, it's about the directors. It has always, you used to be less about you know, who is playing it, but he, he, it's always whose film is it? But more and more, you see the audience gravitating toward movies because such and such and such is playing in those movies. If I take the case of Nollywood, the initial video and then move to film industry, you talk about, you know, because Genevieve, everybody, almost first name, a lot. Is, it's bankable names that kind of pushed uh, Nollywood beyond the continent to the diaspora. So, you in, so in terms of the images, in terms of circulation of images, it's more and more going, you know, bypassing of a traditional institution. And uh, I think like Barbara was saying, uh, is who all those uh, images, if we cannot have access to it? And Maybe it's controversial, but it's not controversial because I always talk about it, which is I, you know, I work and live in the U.S., but you see some of the, of the iconic African filmmakers, the archives are in the U.S., at the, in U.S. universities owned. So how do African filmmakers or researchers get access to those archives? I know, you know, some of those universities are saying, no, no, we're putting those archives online and African scholars can have access to it. But that means that you, if you have reliable internet or electricity, I'm just saying that you have some challenges when it comes to circulation of images archival. I actually have two more questions, but since we are running out of time, I would like first ask you, if you also have some. Mark. It's just a little question. Yeah, thank you both. Um, and um, uh, Bukhari, because you just mentioned, I know you're, like in Nollywood, the importance of the star. I just wonder, um, um, I mean, the, the Burkino, the post Burkino Faso period, um, I, I, well, okay, it's a different context. I'm just wondering, um, did um because um Klein Fernsehspiel seems to push the director, the auteur, director as auteur, um, is that how has does how does that sync with um the filmmaking practices in the Burkina Faso school? Is that something that that was already um present there, this emphasis on the director as the key figure, or did that come through this collaboration. So I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more about the, the encounter with um, Set Day F um, in this uh, Burkina Faso context. And if I may add maybe uh, the same question specifically for the um, films by uh, Jean-Marie Tenot, I would be interested in hearing a bit more about that. So I, I would say, you know, when uh, for ZDF, or I will put ZDF in the context of uh, producing and broadcasting, uh, I would say, through the small screen television here. Uh, I would say, like in Nigeria, you have a starting uh, the late, night, I think uh, the first uh, Burkina Faso locally produced uh, television series, 1997 or 1999. And those who uh, 
those who played really becomes uh, bec uh, those uh, those who played in those series became the stars. When I say the stars, and they start mobilizing uh, audience to gravitate toward, you know, called, I would say a genre known as uh, comedies. Which is in, in terms of production. So I would say you. To answer your question, prior to uh, the star coming on in the, the television, it's all, always about the very serious drama, which is more playing to the international audience. But the more the comedy uh, that, you know, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, I would say, thematic treatment, is more like neighborhood gossip doesn't get attention. And more, you know, we can make the link uh, with uh, Nollywood. I would say that what ZDF and others, you know, pushing, you know, was a little, you know, I would say not instrumental, but at least, you know, was a cue in into that direction. But prior to that, you have a tradition, you know, before Burkina Faso, if you take, uh, I would, can argue that you have a school of Côte d'Ivoire, you have a school of, uh, uh, in terms of comedy, which is use its humor. So, and I think that has always been there, but it simply needed, uh, I don't want to say push, but a space, a space to, uh, to evolve and then be recognized. And then you said for Jean-Marie, you know, yeah, uh, in terms of... Uh, um, yeah, what, what do you think, what um, role did ZDF, Kleines Fernsehspiel, play for him in his work? For, for him, is as his work, I will put it in the larger context. Uh, when I say African cinemas, really, we see the diversity, because uh, uh, Jean-Marie Jean Tenos uh, comes really early 1990s, when he, you know, okay, he got his first, you know, his first recognition as Vespaco. But prior to that, when we talk about documentary practice on the continent, documentary were mostly associated with Lusophone Africa, Portuguese-speaking Africa. And that's we understand with you know the struggle for independence that came very late with documents you know almost everything. So to see so some I would say will be you know, okay, some of the first really to come with uh, at least from French speaking Africa with a very serious documentary practice. But fast forward 20 years later, 30 years later, you have you know, we now have a, a larger you know okay, and diverse. Uh, generation of a documentary on the continent. I'm talking from, you know, French speaking. Mm. And content wise, because both films are about migration, was that also something, or do you know that um, whether this had to do something with the ZDF um, co production? That will be very interesting because I, I think, uh, sorry, I forgot your name, I think the USA, some of the criteria. Uh, uh, by ZDF, I, I don't have access to the criteria which one you know guided uh, the, the production. But it very, I personally, I would be interested in knowing, you know, okay, in terms of international productions, what who really shapes the content. Mm. Um, I know that we are running out of time. Um, however. Um, there is obviously a lot more research to do, and I feel like this is, I mean, we had in the first panel like already like a, like a lot of research that was already done. I think for most of us, uh, this is um, um, creating here a starting point for um, um, a lot more research. And But Barbara, because you started your presentation with some suggestions for such research, and you know, like since you now know work at the Arsenal, like, and you have an idea at the Arsenal, you have to follow up with, um, with it. Um, so maybe we can continue this research um, uh, and build on your ideas. And uh, um, I would also appreciate to find out a lot more um, about uh, uh, yeah, the African films in the ZDF. Because actually, the, um, we were wondering a bit what, what, what uh, pr surplus is there to focus on regions <laughs> in the transnational um, larger question of the of the conference, of the symposium, and maybe the the re so-called regions are actually comparable in 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 the sense that at some point they are empowerment of national film schools and developments, but at the same time they always go beyond and they. I mean, or is it just some part of your 
um, presentation that, that, that's beyond, or do you also see it in the in the project list? No, because Visa was really responding to uh, this symposium here to give to give an example, a situated history of uh, uh, cinema where ZDF has you know some influence. Otherwise, uh, the question of um, uh, social exclusion and uh, the African village of what, what is modernity, I think that has been explored beyond Burkina Faso, beyond uh, West Africa. So, I was but, but what I wanted to add about, uh, sorry, one last thing about, uh, about Eastern Europe, I think you have to really uh, have some very knowledgeable <laughs> scholars who speak a lot of languages and who also know the specific context of the countries that they're working, you're working with, because, uh, like, at what point does Poland become open for, you know, collaborative? What da time does it close again? And it might not be the case in Czechoslovakia tot at the same time, and, and not to speak of Soviet Union, etc. So there is really, um, this. the research needs not just uh, very, very varied uh, sources of material, and I would totally <laughs> encourage your idea to, to put put them together and even like Arsenal, for example, archive and, and CDF archive, etc. And uh, add the, you know, the timelines also that are um, maybe sometimes helpful. To the, yeah. And I, I think what really became clear in both of your presentations is that um, beyond um, the efforts of CDF Kleines Fernsehspiel to support auteurs and um, uh, there's also like something else um, um, how in, in the way they function really as I don't know how you would translate Möglichkeitsraum, like really how, how, how they, um, how would you say that? Um, yeah, but, but yeah, how they really um, um, make something enable um, um, certain film productions in, um, in the Cold War, transnational film productions, productions in the Cold War or um, um, in um, African countries in terms of um, economics also. Like there's, um, I think, this aspect of really um, finding urgencies and, um, and then uh, enabling um, uh, films to be um, made or filmmakers to produce their work is also like a really important role that ZDF Kleines Fernsehspiels played worldwide um, or in many countries. I would like to thank you so much for um, for your presentations. I think um, Alexander now wants to tell us about the lunch. <laughs> Well, thanks a lot for the presentations. We have now a break off. Uh, good, we have it on screen. We uh, pick up again a quarter to three. Please be on time. Um, there are different possibilities in and around the house and um, the speakers are invited to a buffet in the ateliers. And yes, see you back at the quarter to three. Did I forget? And the moderators too, of course, yes. <laughs> Okay, see you back.